I like your necklace, it's very smart. Well, thank you. You're welcome. I'm trying to work out how if we have conference, you're going to keep us all five foot apart, never mind 10 foot, you know, two meters. As, as um, suits, I think. I think you'll just have cuddle piles all over the place of people squealing. Yeah. <laughs> Hello to those of you who are joining. I can't see you, but I'm watching the numbers go up. So we're just going to wait oh, okay. a bit before we get started so that people can join. On Monday, we had some people who missed the start, missed me introducing everybody, which is terribly sad for them. Right, I think we might have stabilised there the number. Okay. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us today. It's, I'm sitting in my loft in Teddington and the rain is pouring down outside. So it's very nice to be with all of you on Zoom uh, talking about books. Um, I'm Meryl Halls, Managing Director of the Booksellers Association, and I'm delighted to uh, welcome you to the third of our Springboard sessions this week, um, which is a new project that we're working on this year with the Bookseller Magazine, uh, which is a week of conversation and uh, delight about the forthcoming titles for the spring season. Um, I think we're all uh, a bit more, despite the weather today, a bit more buoyant about uh, the prospect of reopening and hopefully bookshops will be open again in mid-April. I know booksellers are really keen to get their shops looking ship shape and full of fantastic books. So hopefully the Springboard sessions this week are helping booksellers uh, refine what they might buy and also inspire and delight them um, uh, with what's coming. So um, every day this week, we've had a bookseller previewer and an independent bookseller in conversation um, to one extent or another. And we on, on Friday, we're having a slightly different session. So please do check in on Friday where we're having uh, some authors uh, odes to booksellers. So that should be a fun session on Friday too. But the titles discussed during the week are going to be circulated to everyone. So don't worry if you can't write quickly enough. We've got the lists uh, ready to send out. So that will happen automatically. So today we have Caroline Sanderson, who's known fixed previewer for the bookseller, and Mary Moser, the, uh, I was going to say eponymous, but you're not the eponymous owner <laughs> of the Edinburgh Bookshop. Infamous. You're just Infamous. the owner of the Edinburgh Bookshop, <laughs> uh, much loved and known by her peers. Um, and just to say that this is a bit different for, for BA members who are used to our Zoom calls. This is in webinar form, so you obviously can't see each other. You can't see the speakers, but the speakers can't see you. So if you have any any chat, any comments, any questions, do put them in the chat function and uh, we'll try and keep an eye on that towards the end. But I'm just going to hand over now to Caroline and to Mary to introduce themselves. And thank you very much for coming. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Meryl. I'm, I'm, well, I, I can I just say that I'm entirely thrilled to be doing this. Um, not least because I was once a bookseller myself back in the last millennium. And um, uh, I, you might think that I get enough, sent quite enough books uh, because of my job, but um, frankly, I can't wait for bookshops to open again myself as well. So do you want me to, do you want to introduce yourself, Mary? Or shall I, I can do, no, I, can, I can do that quickly. Um, I'm Mary, I've run the Edinburgh Bookshop for the last eight years. Um, we are, like a lot of you, a small independent on a, high, on a local high street, um, half of our business is children's. And being in Scotland, we're a little bit spoiled at the moment because we've been allowed to do click and collect since we reopened in January because the Scottish government declared bookshops were essentials, which I think is thanks to Merrill's campaigning. And we're hoping to reopen properly, probably beginning of April. That's, that's it. Excellent. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to come to Edinburgh yet, but I'll be, <laughs> I'll make it there as soon as I can. So um, I'm just really looking forward to chatting to you about um, forthcoming nonfiction. Um, I, 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 uh, I, these days I work as a freelance writer and editor and books journalist, um, and I interview a lot of writers on, um, on the page and on stage and other places as well, on Zoom usually nowadays. Um, and I've, I've been, actually last November um, was my 20th anniversary of doing the nonfiction previews. I've been doing them every month wow. since the year 2000. I had one month off when my daughter was born in 2001. So um, 
I, I think, um, yeah, that that's a lot of books, but I, you know, I still find it really exciting, incredibly stimulating. It doesn't ever go away, that feeling, I don't think. I think I always feel like the worst read person I know since I own a bookshop <laughs> because you're always aware. I'm looking at what you've read and just going, oh my God, when am I going to get time to read that? When am I going to get time to read that? But I think as booksellers, even the knowledge the books are there is after the battle, you know, having that sort of Rolodex of, yes, somebody's written a book about that and I know where I can get it to you, even if you haven't read them all yourself. I mean, I don't know whether to envy your job or feel sorry for you, really, because I've given up trying to keep up. I just do what I can. Well, I think it's, um, yeah, I, I, I <laughs> no, I, I think if you told me 20 years ago or, or even further back that, you know, I was going to be paid uh, to, to read books, it, it would be, I would have been, I thought that was a kind of absolute mir miraculous thing to say, I think. No. Um, but yes, I mean, it, it's, uh, I, I think one of the frustrations is that I, I've, I don't have time to read everything from cover to cover. I read a lot of things from cover to cover, but there's lots of things I read far too quickly and just want to want to go back to. Um, but I'm, you know, constantly in this kind of impelled forward by publishing schedule. So, you know, the kind of um, holidays of, for me are about catching up on fiction, which right. of course I also like to read. And uh, a lot of them recommendations from my um, colleague, Alice O'Keefe. Um, mm -hmm. And, and, and also just that thing of, you know, sometimes you just want to read things again or read classics or, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's, um, we're lucky to have all these kind of options and places to go. But yeah, that's why I like bookshops just as much because I always end up buying books as well. So it's just oh, hell yeah. <laughs> no end to it, really. <laughs> the busman's holiday. Um, the worst thing, if you remember about being a bookseller, is also you may find yourself tidying somebody else's bookshop, which is a really rude habit <laughs> I've slipped into. If I'm in a large shop somewhere and the section is in a bit of a mess, you find yourself absentmindedly going, oh, I'll, I'll just do that quickly. So where would you like to start? You picked out a couple of ones that are probably already out. I don't know if you, they're still on your list or whether you wanted to go into the new well, ones. I mean, you know, so, so much we could talk about. So I've, yeah. I've just picked out a few things and, and then or I'm sure you'll have other, uh, other think titles you want to highlight as well. So it's kind of the beauty of doing this as a kind of two-hander. But um, yeah, I, I just, uh, I was thinking a lot um, in February about nonfiction debuts and the fact that we, we so often talk about debuts as being fiction and I find this sort of slightly frustrating because I, I find that there are such great, you know, fiction debuts around and February was a case in point where there were, were three terrific memoirs, which I think one of the prevailing themes of this year's nonfiction are, are questions of race and identity uh, for obvious reasons and um, so the three stunning memoirs in February, there's Brown Baby by Nika Shukla, um, Aftershocks by Nadia Awusu and um, Raceless by Georgina Lawton, who I actually interviewed for the bookseller. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, we're, I guess uh, we're all trying very hard to check our privileges, but also just try and, um, you know, put ourselves in the shoes of others and what it, what it must have been like, what, what it must be like to live lives um you know from a very different point of view and uh you understand what it's like not to have your white privileges for example and, and though you know books are a, are a, an amazing way of trying to of helping you to do that and uh those three books i'd i'd pick out uh, in particular all out now of course i thought also what was interesting is although clearly um the non-white issue for want of a better way to put it the black issue is the most pressing one out there i thought what was also interesting is as an undercurrent i've come across with a couple of other authors in edinburgh is also this fact that race um or not fitting being an immigrant is quite an interesting subject again that comes up in these books um i mean aftershocks i think particularly because she's lived in so many countries at various stages of her young life and what does belonging mean and i think you know even with white privilege i think there's a lot of echoes of other people's experiences who are second or third generation and yet you know you don't fit I mean I'm one um, <laughs> and you realize that you think you fit but you don't actually um, so I, I think they work on double levels I think they educate you on what you are privileged about and don't realize you're privileged about and then I think you will as of many things in literature you find a connection you weren't expecting where you think oh yeah 
now that I get, you know, and I think, you know, it's one of the things I love about reading nonfiction, as you say, is you find yourself in bits when you don't expect it. That's so true. Yes, it's so true. And, and you know, as you mentioned, Aftershocks, Nadia Wusish, I mean, she has parents who were from different continents, you know, and I think that and, and yet had this very shifting sort of um, upbringing. And, you know, that that's uh, for anybody who sort of lived, you know, in the same place all their life. I mean, it's just an extraordinary thing to read about and reflect upon, I think. And I, I thought raceless too. the fact that obviously it's a magnificent um, I don't want to call it a lie in her family. They just chose to ignore she was black and her father wasn't and her mother wasn't. So, you know, um, but then it also to me led into then also, again, families who tell lies about whose child is whose. And you know what I mean? Again, it's almost back to if we don't talk about it, we don't have to deal with it. And I think people will find double echoes in that book again for the same reason. I mean, it's left her with a, I don't want to say terrible, I don't want to judge for her, but you know, an amazing problem of who is she when you know, nobody ever acknowledged that she must have a black father. Um, but at the same time, there will be other people it resonates that, you know, families not telling the truth about all sorts of things going on in a family and nobody wanting to fess up. I think it'll ring a lot of bells that way. Well, I think all families have their, their, their sort of dark corners, don't they? Yeah. Um, and yes, one, um, yeah, three books I'd, I'd, you know, I'm so, so pleased that I've read and, uh, yeah. The other ones I wanted to tag on, which is the other end of it, which are just selling really well in our business. Um, there's a couple that right now, um, Empire Land by Sathnam Sangira, um, How Imperialism Shaped Modern Britain, which if you like is the empire, which again, we've never dealt with, we've never talked about really. And there's a, a cousin to that, Britain Alone, The Path from Suez to Brexit by Philip Stevens. Um, they've been selling really well in my store because we are a horribly white middle class area that's who we are garden readers to the core but I think what is encouraging is there is a great interest at very least in how did we get to the corner we're in you know what I mean how did we get so um, rigid about certain subjects and so out of sync with bits of the world so I think I'm quite encouraged that those are selling as well as things like how to argue with racists and yeah understanding our history I think is important. It's really heartening to see those sort of those books selling really well and um, I, I think the Satnam Sangira is one that I, I I did have to read really quickly. Okay right. It came into me quite late but I, I know I'm, I'm interviewing him at a, a literary festival later this year so I'm I'm so looking forward right. to, to engaging with that book. And I'm hoping but I don't know what's in it yet in April Power of Geography Tim Marshall's what new ones coming out. Yes. And of course Prisons of Geography was for me, such a clever book, you know, helping you understand how, how the world gets into all these pickles. And I gather this is meant to plow that far further, but I haven't seen it yet. So I'm quite optimistic. Again, that will add to people's knowledge and inquiry on the subject. Yeah, that will be great. And I mean, perhaps this is a good time to, to talk about my book of the month for April, yes. which is um, I Belong Here by Anita Sethi. Uh, this is the proof. It's amazing. I haven't got the I've got finished copy yet, but um Again, that was my book of the month and again I, I was I was fortunate to interview uh, Anita I mean Anita's a books journalist as I am and I'm you know I've come up I've, I've met her quite a few times on a sort of career level and really really liked her and I, I really admire her writing so followed her on Twitter and then was utterly horrified to see uh, that, that she could because she was sort of tweeting at the time about this horrible racist hate crime that she was the victim of in 2019. Yeah on a train traveling through the north of England. And, um, you know, um, and lots of people picked up on it and she received lots and lots of me me uh, messages of support, but it was just just horrendous. So I kind of, you know, I, I, I hadn't forgotten that. And then discovered that she was uh, writing this really extraordinary book called I Belong Here, A Journey Along the Backbone of Britain. So, so this book is, exploring similar themes but it blend beautifully blends nature writing with memoir with travelogue with mm. current affairs as as she as she journeys through the Pennines it's a sort of an act of reclamation in a book which you know because having been told to go home and you know get back on the banana boat as a as a, a born and bred Mancunian, you know, I mean, yeah. it's an act of defiance as well, just saying, you know, how dare you tell me, <laughs> you know, I'm from the North and I'm proud to be from the North. So, uh, and, and I just, um, I, I felt kind of outraged, but also just so moved by it that- um, It also know. sounded like it, it had also 
as well, I mean, as you say, outrage and we, gosh knows, we need to hate, hate deal with the hate on all these channels. But then also the fact that a theme you find in, in, in quite a few memoirs, you know, that the healing power of going out and doing something in the natural world too, you know, even after something as horrible has happened to her, that walking the Pennines did help her sort through it and find some peace. And, I, you know, that's a theme we've encountered in books like Wild before. Yes. Very much so. She talks about writing and walking and walking and writing as being that, you know, that, you know, such healing things. And I, I think if you believe in books as a force for good, uh, which, of course, we all do, um, the really shining example of that, I think. Um, and, you know, that the idea that such a hate defying sort of experience is brought forth this 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 book full of hope i mean i'm not saying that everything's been magically healed no. by any means but uh i just i i, I found that I, fa I found it such a such a beacon really especially in the times we've been we've been yeah. going through so um and it's also as you say just a wonderful piece of nature writing you know if you if you if you love the hills if you love walking and hiking it's a it's a great book as well and you're not the only person sort of to pick it out either, because I think it's a Guardian book of the month, Waterstones, it's one of the ones to watch. Excellent. I mean, the rumble behind it is quite big. So if anybody's got any doubts out there, it sounds like it's an important book this year. Definitely. Who do you want to go to next? What should we talk about next? Did we did we sort of miss out? We kind of missed out March, didn't we? That's that's an April title. Um, I suppose I should just give a mention to uh, Michael Rosen's um, many different kinds yeah. of love, uh, which you know, I mean, it'll be so interesting to see. And well, I mean, already there are books coming through that are in some way reflecting on the the pandemic uh, and the COVID crisis. Uh, uh, and I'm sure that's going to continue in, in many kind of forms for quite some time to come. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just, he is, Michael Rosen is, is, is such a, you know, uh, one tries not to use kind of phrases like national treasure, but I mean, I just, if you need cheering up, you, you go on his YouTube channel and you watch him doing chocolate cake, for example. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's just so wonderful. So, I mean, you know, and there was so much sort of rejoicing when we heard that he was kind of out of danger. But this is an account really of, he, he wrote it to try and piece together what would happen because it was only really at the, the tail end of being so ill with COVID and he nearly died and was hospitalised for several months and in an induced coma. You know, the writing it initially was a, was a way of piecing together what had happened to him and then turned into this tribute um, to the strangers who, you know, as he put it, tried to keep him alive. And it's a sort of a mixture. It's a kind of prose poem, but also mixed up with some of the letters, the notes that the nurses nice. left him uh, to kind of um, urge him on in his recovery. And uh, yeah, it's it's um. It's a, it's a wonderful, a wonderful book, but also, in, again, angry in places, really, about the idea that, you know, people who are in their 70s and 80s might be in some way expendable, you know. Yeah, I think certainly where I think it may have an extra route in for us is my gut says some of the books on the pandemic, people will be, all I've done for 18 months is think about pandemics. I don't want to read them at the moment. That's my gut. But I think somebody like Michael writing about it, you say, who is a thread through most of our lives, you know, whenever you discovered Bear Hunt or whatever, or his poetry. So people have a sort of, it's it, it's almost like a permanence in your life. You know, there's Michael Rosen, you know, his. So I think people will want to hear this and they'll want to hear this voice from somebody they feel they know a bit and respect. And then, as you say, some of his anger, I mean, I've seen some of his retorts to anti-vaxxers and they're both hilarious and frustrating because at one point somebody tweeted at him, I'd like to hear the story from somebody who's actually had it. <laughs> and he said, but I have. And their reply was, I only have your word for that. <laughs> you know, how do you come back from that? So I, th I think it could be an important book on different levels. I think it could be a really useful book for people. Yeah. And as you say, cheering, hopefully, too. We sang Bear Hunt the day Trump was elected. That's what we did at Storytime. We ate cake and sang Bear Hunt loudly. Oh, how marvellous. How marvellous. <laughs> tea, cake and communal singing is always a cheering thing, we felt. so. 
Yeah, I, I, that kind of, you know, yeah, Bear Hunt is a kind of national ballad, isn't it, really? It is, it is, it is yes. Yeah, so. so good. So good. So it was an absolute privilege to talk to him. Nice. Um, and then um, I guess I'd, I'd quite like to mention this one, Seven and a Half oh. Lessons About the Brain, which is also coming out in March. It's lovely. Finished. It's just arrived and it's the most beautiful cover I've seen in a long time. So I agree with you. It's just come into the shop. Yeah. It's, it's, only, uh, it's only a little book um, uh, out from Picador. And um, yeah, I'm just sort of, let me just... Yeah, so she's, um, I'm always aspiring to read more popular science. I mean, I, I, like everyone else, I often struggle to get my head around it as a, as a non-scientist, but I, I have this aspiration that I'm going to read more. And, and so this is a kind of ideal book for me anyway, because um, Lisa Feldman Barrett, she's among the top 1% most cited scientists in the world for her research in the fields of psychology and neuroscience. Um, so she's very eminent, but what she's come up with is these seven really gem-like sort of essays on no, what the latest so. neuroscience is telling us about the brain, which is really quite revolutionary in the sense of, you know, a lot of the things that we routinely talk about, but probably don't quite understand, like the concept of having a little mm. brain or nature and nurture. And, um, what I also love about it is she sort of uses her scientific knowledge to lo lobby for a better world, really, as well, you know. So uh, that was one that I really, I really took to. And uh, you can sort of read it in, you know, in bite sized chunks, which, um, you know, makes it sound a bit like science light, but it definitely isn't. I I, th I think we should, we call it popular science in the shop for that reason. I mean, um, if you look at how Carlos Rovelli sold, you know, his, his books on space and things so I, th I think it should go really well I'm quite excited to read it myself because you know one is always aware we don't understand the half of what's going on in our noggins so yes and it's beautiful it's absolutely beautiful to look at gorgeous it always helps absolutely does yes what next where do we get up to <laughs> well you're heading down I mean do you want to talk bumblebees you were waving it earlier that's all I was waving you but my bumblebee book <laughs> Well, you see, I was lucky enough. Not a bad to, thing. I was lucky enough to get one of the first um, finished copies of this, "Gardening for Bumblebees" by uh, Dave Goulson, and I think I think it turned up in January, and it was just obviously you can see it's the sunniest, um, the the sunniest looking book, and and Dave Goulson is just, I mean, he is a foremost expert on on insects in general, and this autumn um, sees the publication of what's build as his real magnum opus on insects silent earth averting the insect apocalypse so but but this this book coming out in spring from square peg well it's about how you go about creating a paradise for pollinators in your own garden and um i have an aspiration this year to grow flowers uh for, for cutting nice. um but i'm also uh so I, in this very room just over there i've got a um some seedlings of snapdragons growing so i'm growing all these seeds for the first time and it just feels like the most wonderful thing to do and this is kind of my bible to um the, the, the flowers that you know I, I need to grow and it's got all these lovely can you see that pages of isn't it beautiful? I hadn't realized to a little friend taught me how many bees there were in Britain so I have a, a small friend who's about 10 who likes to walk me along and point them all out and I felt incredibly ignorant so I probably will be having a little look at it because I think there's 20 something bees aren't there 26 species of bumblebee who knew <laughs> well, apparently Rory I can't see which bookshop Rory's on but he's on the chat yeah, going I'm a bee keeping chat guesser does know. Um. <laughs> <laughs> but the rest of us I don't think did and I think you know that again struck me well okay that I mean, we all know the bees are declining but yes what a charming book to have and you've, I have I personally think I'm sure a lot of other booksellers agree that things like gardening this year should kick up because we've had to look in. We won't necessarily all be flying everywhere. What's the next obvious thing for book lovers? Go play with any spot, spot of land or window box you can find, you know. Yes, I, I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I, I sort of feel like gardening books have, I mean, I'm not, this is not a bookseller's view, obviously, but I feel as if gardening books have been slightly in the doldrums for a long time. It's almost as if everybody was kind of, oh, well, you know, you can get all that information yeah. online. 
And, and now there's some, some beautiful and really inspiring books coming out, but obviously a lot to have this um, environmental, you know, um, yeah. take as well, which is just so important. And I remember last year having grown some pelagoniums that I thought were or bought from the garden centre that were kind of hot pink and I thought they were fabulous. But when I saw a bee circling around them and couldn't get any nectar from them I, I was just kind of heartbroken and I thought what am I doing so <laughs> my resolution this year to uh, grow proper pollinators <laughs> nice I think it's an excellent view um I mean you, you've had flagged up also this year I mean there's a lovely one coming from Deborah Levy but I almost feel like saying to book sales with Deborah Levy we all know it'll sell I don't oh, mean that I know it's encouragingly it's it will one. sell it's great I mean like, you know we need bankers and I like that um, the one I was interested in, because I honestly don't know if I will be able to sell it, I will absolutely be stocking it. Um, the Paris Lees um, the memoir. Yes. autobiographer memoir, I think the reviews for it are astounding. I haven't seen it yet, but the reviews are astounding. Um, what it feels like for a girl. Um, for those who don't know, Paris um, is a, are we allowed to say trans? I wouldn't offend her that way. Um, writer, blogger, influencer, model indeed, she's on the Pantene advert. Um, and this is her journey as a younger person. Yes, um, I, uh, yeah, first trans woman to appear on Question Time. And as you say, mm -hmm. now columnist and a contributing editor for Vogue. I mean, we were talking earlier about trying to, trying to get, you know, to, to understand what it's like to be in somebody else's shoes. And I yeah. think um, there's been so much invective, uh, you know, directed towards the trans community by people who just can't have any idea about it really, it seems to me. But um, what what I loved about this is it's it's such an utterly distinctive memoir. It's written in, a, in the kind of Nottinghamshire vernacular. So if you think, you know, James Kelman, for example, yeah. But 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 Nottingham, um, my mother's from Nottingham, so and I'm I'm a Midlander myself, so I I sort of you know it it sort of has a ring for me uh, actually. But it, it's written almost out loud is how I described it, um, and it really hauls you into the world that she grew up in, and facing sort of daily battles for acceptance, being beaten up at school for talking like a puff, and mm. longing to to um, escape the the hellhole of sort of where she's grown up and not really caring how. So it's, 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 you know, it's kind of shocking. It's also really funny. Uh, I just thought it was completely brilliant. Um, and it's, it's kind of really compelling. You know, once you, once you sort of, a bit like a kind of James Kalman thing where it takes you a little while to immerse yourself in, in the language, but once you do, I mean, it's just, it's just brilliant. So um, yeah, and I think that that's definitely one of the best memoirs I've read so far this year. I don't think you can ask for a much bigger recommendation. I certainly think, I mean, again, you know, I did a bit of nosing around it and the, the, the buzz on it is there and not just because she's a name, there clearly is a buzz on, it's quite a striking book. And I thought that I think then is good, great because that makes the wider audience easier to grab as a bookseller. You can say to people, yeah. you're, you're, you're gonna find something in this. It's a great piece of writing. The writing is so good. Yeah, really utterly distinctive as well. Um, um, you, you've actually, come, I mean, in your little list you sent me, you had quite a few in a row that were, how can I put it, issue driven, but in a great way. I mean, the next one you had said was The Devil You Know, which is about um, psychiatrists, psychologists who work with violent criminals. And I thought, what a such an important book, because of course it's too easy to do what the crime programs do and say, you know, it's, it's people who are evil. And obviously this book is looking further than that and going, it's not that glib, it's a much layered problem. It completely is, right. So uh, uh, there we go. Um, I've just, I'm not getting them very well. There you are, I've got you. Yeah, yeah, I can see you. yeah. I'm, um, yeah, I've just sort of finished reading this because I've just just filed my June preview. Um, the Devil You Know by uh, Gwen Ads, Adshead and uh, written with Eileen Thorne coming from Faber. She is a forensic psychiatrist and psychotherapist who works mainly with violent offenders. She worked at Broadmoor Hospital for a long time. Um, and again, I keep saying that work, you know, really puts you into the heads of people. But um, uh, there are um, 11 men and women profiled here. They're, they're actually composites, but sort of based on very much on real cases. Um, and it really puts you in the heads of these people in a way that's 
really empathetic, but also transformative. It's a sort of the antithesis of that famous John Major quote, which is society needs to condemn a little more and understand a little less. Um, and it's, a, you know, it takes a really deep dive into where really dark stories of these, these terrible, you know, terrible crimes and um, that she describes as a tragedy for the victims and their families, as well as for the, the perpetrators, how they can enlighten us about, you know, not only how to prevent these crimes from happening, but, but, but also just, um, you know, they illuminate all sorts of aspects, I think, of human nature and, and, um, you know, and most importantly, I suppose, for this for society now, how we deal with kind of mental illness and how that's received, you know, less and less funding. And, you know, it, I mean, it's clear that a lot of these tragedies are a direct result of how, you know, people whose lives are in crisis, particularly when they're um, children, yeah. you know, that's a big yeah. focus of her work of how, you know, childhood adversity affects um, what happens in later life. You know, and how we're, we, we've sort of created a lot of this by, by our attitude to people. So I'm making it sound incredibly, you know, dark and serious, which of course it is, but also it's just, it's just wholly fascinating. And because it's done in that, that time-honoured um, case history way, which is always very compelling. And we've had a number of books, of course, that have done very well that, that, that do that. Um, yeah, so that's that's a big book for June for me. I, I was interested that you picked it out because, you know, obviously booksellers, the crime genre is absolutely massive for us. And I thought, you know, um, I know how much I loved, if that's the right word, um, The Psychopath Test by John Ronson, which goes on the not quite so dark end of this, but the same kind of principle of, you know, what is crazy and who decides and what if you're wrong? And I think then to take it the next step on and say, okay, these are the people who we maybe do need to be kept distance from, but at the same time, how, what, what can we learn? What can we change? So um, I just thought it was really interesting you picked that up because it's clearly not a voyeuristic book. That's not why it's been written. It's a book trying to help us understand. Mm. Not in the least. And I, and, I, and I mean, I think it just really shows that uh, if we, if our attitude to these people is, you know, kind of lock them up and throw away the key, then we're doing all of us a disservice. You know, we're, we're doing all of us harm really by having that attitude. So um, yeah, uh, uh, it's a, it's a powerful book. Um, okay. And then the one you'd listed behind it, I thought was interesting because it also then showed what happens when, uh, so I'm putting you under pressure because you're thinking, what did I list next? And the answer is like, the, Ethel, the, F, the Ethel Rosenberg book. But I thought it was interesting because Ethel Rosenberg, um, for those who don't know, was the last American woman to be executed for spying. I think it was technically. And she was executed with her husband for allegedly colluding with the Soviets. And I think all the evidence now says her husband was a spy and she had no bloody idea. Um, and they had two children. And that it, it's kind of like the Birmingham Six. Once the train left the station, with these are bad Russian spies. And that was the culture at the time, fear and everything else, that there's no way she can get out of this. She is condemned from the start. And I thought it was really interesting, actually, you, you'd accidentally listed that behind, because again, it's about how we perceive justice and what if you don't approach it, approach it with as level a mind as you can, but you start with, you know, these people are dangerous or bad. You know, where does it take you? So I thought it was just quite interesting. You'd put the two next to each That's other. really interesting. I hadn't thought Sorry. of it like that, actually. Um, yeah, Ethel Rosenberg, a Cold War tragedy by Anne Seber coming from Weidenfeld. I, I really like Anne Seber's writing. I loved her book, Les, Les Parisiennes, yeah. about the lives of French women during the, the Second World mm. War. Um, and yes, it's 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 quite a short book, this, but, um, and I'm still, I'm just finishing it, actually, but... You know, it's it's just oh, I've got this heartrending opening where you know it's the execution of um, Ethel Rosenberg and her and her husband. The electric chair, wasn't yeah. it? I, Nine... I did American history a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, oh, and they've got these two young children, children. and you just uh, yeah, and, and you're just asking, you know, what what on earth? But I mean, you know, the 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 um, uh, 
the film rights have been snapped up by Miramax. Yeah. It's got huge, you know, high praise. Victoria Hislop, Philippe Sands, um, Anthony Horowitz, Claire Tomalin. So, so yeah, I think it's going to receive an, an awful lot of attention. But it's it's one of those books. I'm I'm not a great reader of um, spy books. Um, yeah. I mean, I love I love Ben McIntyre's books, but there's not a genre that I'm uh, particularly sort of pick up um, by choice. But I mean, I think that this is. Um, this has all the elements of a thriller. In fact, it's been billed as a, a feminist Cold War thriller, but it's it's also at, in the manner of the best of that genre. They really also teach you about history and that period immediately um, post the Second World War, especially in America, and the kind of the the in particular the sort of Jewish attraction to communism, given what was going on in yeah, yeah. what had been going on in Europe. I found, I found that completely fascinating and, and very illuminating. And also, um, and I apologize because I cannot remember the name of the author who taught me this, but I had not realized I took over bookshop that the Cold War, is, one of the reasons we have spies and things is that the Britain and America did a book pass. I mean, we went from these people being our allies to being communists or our enemies at the end of the war because for Russian state getting too powerful. And a lot of the people who got involved in spying just didn't agree with the book, with the change. It wasn't that they were trying to betray their countries. It was like, but these are my friends and I admire them and all the rest. And therefore um, you have also, I mean, even Operation Paperclip, which again, I didn't know about for a long time, which is where we stole the best Nazis. The best Nazi brains were taken to America and they literally had new biogs clipped to them and it was called Operation Paperclip. And you have all the shenanigan leading then to this kind of absolute communists are bad and dangerous um, and cases like this. So yeah, I, I only knew about it because I did a history degree a long time ago. Um, so, but I thought it was interesting that her case particularly has been brought back up again because there seems to be, everybody seems to be pretty clear she wasn't involved at all. It just was, she was going down. Well, it just makes you, yes, absolutely. Um, so, you know, that, that miscarriage of justice, but, you know, it's also, as you were talking there, I was thinking, you know, this, this great thing of, you know, we have all these wonderful history books now, um, but it, it, it also really makes you think about, it, it's so easy to know so much with hindsight, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and what we know now, you know, it, yeah. it's, but, but of course, you know, when you're, when you're in the thick of it and you, you, you have, that sort of idea ideology of youth and you have those ideals and you you really want to make you know you want to make the world a better place essentially um which in her case led to led to this terrible tragedy but uh yeah but i think it's also i think i suppose it's interesting it's come back up again because it's that thing about when politics has bouts of political certainty you know this is black this is white i'm right you're wrong we tend to make some horrible, horrible decisions. You know, whereas, as we know, shades of grey are much more near it. So it's just, yeah. That's so true. That's so we true. learn nothing, do we? We know that. Um, your, your next two you put on my list sounded much more optimistic. So I was very pleased that they were the last two on your list, <laughs> which were, well, in a good way, because you can get down with history and then you can things. I thought teaching My Brother to Read by David Owusu was oh, an yes. amazing book. Yes, well, I, I think this is going to be amazing, as you say. I So, um, Derek, no, I haven't read this yet. This is July, so I'm just right, coming okay, on. Right. To, I'm hoping to be able to. No Derek Wusu teaching my brother to read from Murky Books coming in July. So, um, uh, Derek Wusu, um, everyone will probably know from uh, That Reminds Me, really, really distinctive memoir, which yeah. won the 2020 Desmond Elliott Prize. So in, in, this, in this book, he's, um, he's writing about his younger brother who a few years ago was getting into an increasing amount of trouble and sort of losing interest in life and you know, in getting into quite a dark place. And since books have been sort of as, as, uh, as he's written, Derek was has written about before, have been a kind of saving, you know, have been a, a mainstay in his life. He decides to give his brother a different book every month and pay him 50 pounds to read each one uh, as an incentive, obviously. And um, then they meet to talk about the book and what it said to them both and what lessons, if any, it, it offered. And uh, so the result of those conversations is this exploration of the power and meaning of books. So um, what's not to like? <laughs> uh, but yeah, I'm much looking forward to reading that. I thought just, it, it just sounded, I mean, obviously we're all going to love it because we're, you know, we're, we're going to do that. But I also thought this idea of him 
getting his brother past a perceived barrier too, because I think, you know, as a children's book, so it's one thing to Mr. Will, so many children get it into their head, it's not for them, or they're not as bright as their friends or their sibling and things. And it's often just, they've been given nonfiction or fiction and they were the opposite or they want fantasy or maybe they're a graphics novel reader. And I think therefore the fact that he, in a very mercenary way, found a way to f help his brother find some joy yes. in it. Yes. I know. Just well, joyous. It works then. <laughs> well, well, exactly. Um, I think it's Egmont have been doing a study on this actually. Meryl will be able to update you on that. Um, where they've been working with families where reading is not a natural habit or reading to the children isn't a natural habit. And they've got some remarkable results by using small incentives. And I wish we could get governments to realise this, that, you know, it, just yelling at people at school is not necessarily the answer. And I mean, no disrespect to schools in that. But, you know, if you're 16, you're not a great reader and you were given Steinbeck, then try something else, you know. I know. But then you've turned them off, probably. Well, we all love an incentive, don't we? I mean, we all we all need right. incentives at times. Um, so I, I, I'm hoping it gets a lot of coverage because I just thought, one, it was sounded uplifting that, you know, he did change his brother's life. But secondly, just, you know, to get him past those barriers of oh, why would I want to do that sort of thing was just lovely. Yeah. That's right. I'd love to just, um, I'd love to just dip back before we- Dip back, go on, go, go. Um, because uh, I feel as if, and, and I, you know, very much for, for obvious reasons wanted to get at least one uh, small indie publisher in here. So I just want to talk about, um, the, the, these are, are reissues in fact, but they're, they're, they're travel, two works of travel writing by Charmian Clift called Mermaid Singing and Pe oh, yeah. Peel, Peel Me a Lotus. And they're coming out from Muswell Press in April. Now, it was, it was really serendipitous because um, an email arrived about these two books from Muswell Press just as I was finishing uh, Polly Sampson's novel, A Theatre for Dreamers. Um, I, you know, obviously reading fiction has to take sort of second place all the time, but I, I, I loved that, that novel. And, and it was a novel that was directly inspired by these two travel books. Um, so in 1951, Charmin Clift, who, who was Australian and her husband, uh, George Johnston, left post-war London for Greece. And they, they settled first on Kalimnos, which is the island described in Mermaid Singing. Yeah. And then on Hydra, which is described in Pure Me a Lotus. And these are going to be beautiful books. I mean, they're the, okay. you think this is a sunny cover. I, I mean, I'm afraid I haven't got them, but they're just... They just they just shout Greece and I can see someone in the chat saying Leonard Cohen. Just yep, Leonard Cohen. Because they gathered around them this community of artists and writers, and including the then unknown Leonard Cohen. Um, so they're real gems of travel writing, and I I wrote that they'll bring Grecian heat and light to your life and much more besides. Which frankly, you know, what's not to like there? So. I just wanted to No, I think it's good them. you flag them up because I think, you know, travel guides, <laughs> I feel for the travel guide publishers at the moment, but maybe travel writing is where we will get our kicks for a while and, and plan future things by, by going there in our heads. Um, yeah, somebody's saying they like the covers on both the of covers them. The covers are stuff. Sorry, I don't have them to show, but uh, they're, they're, worth, they're worth checking out. I mean, I think if you put those on the front table, they will sell themselves. I mean, the contents are fabulous but once you see the covers uh, they'll just uh yeah but no i think that's a really good tip and in fact the, the other one you you uh, mentioned it's not about travel at all but i'm thinking books that will sell themselves as a middle-aged woman i can't help think but a samley tushi book about cooking and how much it means in family and recipes probably will just sell itself out the door let's be honest i think so that's actually not coming till october i don't think now no, so but it was on your list wasn't it but yeah It'd be worth waiting for. Uh, yeah, all those kind of Italian inspired, you know, recipes. I mean, just and and anecdotes and yeah. yeah. Can't, can't I mean, he, it reminded me of and I do, apologies to my colleague South of I just don't know how big book, these books were. There was a book by Mary Contini called Dear Francesca about 10 years ago. Um, they are in a Scottish Italian family very involved in delis. And it reminded me of the same idea of stories about the family, why the dishes matter, and then the recipes. And I just thought, yeah, that should shine beautifully. Well, I, I'm a, you know, I'm a great lover of good food writing, you know, from Nigella Lawson to, you know, Nigel Slater. And I, I, I think, you, you know, you can't go wrong with some wonderful writing and recipes. But it makes sense that it would move that to nearer Christmas because it strikes me as that kind of mum will love it, gran will love it, aunt will love it, I'll love it. Um, that isn't a criticism, but you can see that would make more sense then there. Um, 
The other one we didn't cover was Barbara Pym. I'm sorry, I've missed her. Um, the Adventures of Barbara Pym, the biography. Paula Byrne, yeah. Paula Byrne. Um, some, yeah. You know, I, I can see Meryl's there, so I'll, yeah, we'll have to cut it I'll short, be brief. I but I mean, I suppose one of the reasons I wanted to mention this was because I, I love Paula Byrne's biographies, but also, isn't it great when you get a non-fiction book, which then gets everybody buying more books? So this is this yeah. biography made me want to go and read um, Barbara Pym's backlist. So that's... <laughs> So I think I, I picked that as a book that, that hopefully sells more books. An excellent reason, if no less. And it usually does work. You're absolutely right. Meryl, I think, wants to see if people have questions, I'm guessing. Well, I've, I've been hesitating to jump in because I've been <laughs> so much listening to you. It's just, I was saying to my team on the WhatsApp group, it's been like over here in a bookshop conversation. <laughs> oh, absolutely right. lovely. <laughs> So, and one of my colleagues said, you've solved all her dad's birthday present problems. So. <laughs> well, if I, you know. So what, what, what more could you possibly hope to achieve than that? Absolutely brilliant. I mean, we, we, we build this as a 45 minutes. So I don't think we've got any questions. We've got lots of lovely comments. People are obviously having a great time listening to you. And it was, that was just absolutely spellbinding. So thank exactly. you. It's oh, nice to be able that. to talk books. <clears throat> Well, I don't have any trouble talking and talking no. talking about books, as you can tell. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, yes, I, did, I really Love. didn't stop you. So we will be sending around the list because I'm not sure you I'm not sure you got to everything actually. But no, if I know, but nearly the list that you may not have talked about, but all, that's a bonus for the booksellers. So we'll be getting those out to everyone. Uh, tomorrow we have got uh, paperbacks. So we've got Alison Flood, who's paperback previewer from the bookseller, and Uli Lenart from Gaze the Word bookshop in London so that's worth tuning in for and as I say the odes to books are on Friday so it just remains to say thank you so much to Caroline and to Mary for joining thank us. you thank you thank you Armin thank you for having and, um, nice to meet you Caroline nice to meet you we'll and see you all soon good luck everybody thank you yes. take care well said take care bye, bye. bye. thanks for coming bye